Hey guys, this is Catching the Mind, uh, episode two, Clearing the Mind, one cash talk at a time. And today, uh, first of all, I'd like to start off with the responses from last video. Uh, we've had um, you know, a lot of positive responses and comments, and we just wanted to say um, thank you, I guess, in that sense for the people who did um, comment and like and support in whatever way that you showed that through. Um, it does mean a lot to us, as it was a very hard thing to um, you know, to do and to come out with all of that sensitive information. And, um, you know, we're glad that we, you know, we, we have you guys on board uh, with respect in that sense um, as well. And uh, yeah, just in today, um, I'm here by myself, not with Jaden, um, because I'm actually introducing uh, Jaden with Chris Seipel, who is our feature guest today. And so um, as agreed, uh, I'm allowing Jaden to interview him today. Um, within his own environment just to make it easier for us. But I just wanted to introduce it to you. Um, the topic goes uh, along the lines of the mask. I'll quickly kind of go into it myself. So I guess the mask is almost like the face you put on obviously when you're either going through something or um, you're hiding something within you and you just don't, or you're pushing it away, all sorts of different stuff. But uh, yeah, obviously Jaden will go more into that, um, but I would like to warn, viewer discretion is advised. There are some very sensitive topics and information that will be discussed, especially on Chris's part. And, um, you know, I do warn if you, you're not expecting, uh, you know, something real or something sensitive like that, uh, please don't watch any further. But apart from that, I'd like to thank you for your support. Um, we're happy to keep doing this and we're happy to you know, uh, keep the light of, um, you know, of sharing and, and being honest. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you next week, guys, in episode three. Have a good one. Cheers. Hey, guys. Happy Friday. I hope you guys had a fantastic day and a fantastic week. My name is Jaden Wollaston, and this is topic two of Couching the Mind, Clearing the Mind, One Couch Talk at a Time. The topic of focus today is the mask. What is the mask you may be asking yourself? Well, to define the mask is one that goes about the day-to-day -day life, making, people to make, um, making out to people that they're actually not suffering. Whereas from the inside, they're actually suffering immensely. They don't know how to open up in a way that they feel comfortable for, do for doing so. To help me with this particular topic today, I've got Chris Seipel, former school teacher here with me today, how he's gonna share his own personal stories of struggle as he had once worn that mask as well too. But once, but one day, enough was enough. He took that mask off and expressed his own inner negative thoughts and emotions to his family and friends. Through this, he's also found certain things that he's implemented throughout his life that have helped to diminish some of the mental struggles that he's facing with on a daily basis. Again guys, and I know Michael has mentioned this in the introduction video, discretion warning. What you may hear today might be quite confronting because I'm asking Chris to be as open and honest as he can possibly be whilst being comfortable for doing so. And yeah, that's pretty much all I've got to say and um, I'd like to pass it over to Chris now. And this is the, um, the story um, of his beginning of struggles and this is episode two of The Mind. Take it away. Cheers, mate. Um, yeah, so in terms of my life and my childhood, so I'm 40 now, so I'm, I'm an old man basically. But yeah. I, I lived a pretty privileged childhood, amazing parents, two good brothers, you know, went to a great school, played rugby, had lots of friends. So mm. from the outside looking in, I look like I had a pretty charmed life. Yep. But things are very different now as to what they were when I grew up. So now there is a lot of discussion, I suppose, about mental health. I don't think we're doing enough. In fact, we're not doing hardly anything at all, but the, the discussion is there. Mm. But when I grew up, there was no... like the, the word mental health didn't exist. Mm. And as amazing as my parents were and how much they supported me and they gave me whatever I wanted, there was never a mention of it being okay to discuss your feelings. And for me, the most important thing in my years of struggle is that parents speak to their kids from the youngest age possible about opening up and talking about their feelings and telling, for me, telling boys okay, that it's especially okay to cry Yes. And, you know, that never happened to me. And another thing that I wish, and this is what I did with, and I'll get into this later, but this is what I did with the boys that I taught, is that I, 
I suppose I I told them that too. I told them mm. that, you know, from the age of 15, when I started teaching the year 10 boys, you need to start talking about your feelings. And I wish, I wish that someone had to come to my school and said that that's all they needed to say to me. Do you feel like as if, uh, being a previous teacher, do you feel like the the school system is is maybe struggling with that side of the side of things in regards to not even talking about mental health? Because I, I believe going through Villa, I know we get we get certain people to come out and talk about uh, using drugs and using alcohol or speeding or that sort of stuff. But I feel like they're lacking in regards to real life advice in terms of how to overcome mental struggle. Yeah, mate, hundred percent. There's. I've been a teacher for 16 years and to be perfectly honest with you, and I'm not bagging any of the schools that I've taught at, but yeah. I have seen very nothing to very little in terms of mental health. Mm. I, I know that at Villanova, the last nine years, they have a school psychologist and a school psychiatrist. Yeah. And I know that kids are sometimes identified as being possibly at risk and they are asked to go and speak to psychologists and psychiatrists. But in terms of support for boys in general at schools and teaching like actively teaching kids mm. and that's what you have to do you have to teach them their skills it's just like teaching kids how to expand in mathematics it's a skill that needs to be taught and it's not done and i've always said that and i don't have kids and i'm divorced but i've always said that i would send my kids to an all boys private school but i actually wouldn't do that just and, because of the way the system runs yeah because from what i've seen Again, I'm not bagging schools, but the curriculum, as you know, is so dense now. And there's so much to learn. Mm. There's so much pressure on you guys that they forget about the you know real life advice. And the kids and, and the schools in. technically don't have time yeah. to do it, especially in high school. They, there's so much that you need to teach that there is no time to do anything like that. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I suppose my struggles. I've always been anxious. And I've always worried. So I worried about school. I worried when I played rugby. And it all really started when I got divorced. So I was with a, a girl for 10 years and we split up in around 2000 and 2011. Yep. And my anxiety really started peaking and it got to the point where it was a 10 out of 10 all day, every day. I sought any every type of help that you could that you could see. Do you mind me asking why it was a ten out of ten on most days? Is there was there a certain thing that that made made it out to be a ten out of ten? I so yeah. So if we go back a year, yep. the first year I was fine. My brother, funnily enough, he split up with his wife at the same time. We moved in together. Mm. We drank heavily. We partied. We had a really good time, and I thought I was okay. And then he got a girlfriend and I had to move out and move out by myself. And that's when it hit me. I'm alone. I've got nothing. Yeah. I don't own anything. I'm 32. And my anxiety just went through the roof. And to be honest, the large majority of my anxiety was a fear of women and relationships because I'd been in a relationship for 10 years where I had never spoken up about my feelings. And that's not her fault. That's me not being able to communicate because I didn't know how to communicate because I'd never been taught it. So. And you feel like that's probably because um, early in childhood you were never shown how to do that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think that, I don't know, I can't speak for women because um, you know, I've worked with boys, but I know a lot of my friends, I know a lot of boys who have issues because of relationships because they don't know how to deal in a relationship. They don't know how to communicate with a female properly and they hold things back and they don't speak up and... Yeah, it causes, fuck, it causes shitloads of problems. Mm. Um, I guess in terms of wearing that mask, um, when did that kind of start? When did that implement within your life? Is Was it sort of when when you started to, to realise that there were certain things from the inside that were actually starting to, um, to cause an effect on you? And you didn't essentially know how to open up and talk about it because um, obviously you said you came from a family where your mother and father loved you very much, but they didn't actually show you or guide you in the way of being able to do that. Do you feel like putting that mask on was um, came about around that sort of time time frame? Yeah, I. If you if if mental health is never spoken about to you and you've got internal worries and anxieties, you think you're the only person in the world that has those. So as a kid growing up, I did not have a clue that anyone was thinking exactly the same way I was. Yeah, I stressed about school. I did well, but I stressed about school. 
rugby union was a massive anxiety for me, but I didn't talk to anyone about it because I didn't know I could. So yeah, like I basically from the age of whenever I can remember up to the age of 33, I never spoke about my emotions, never spoke about my feelings, pretended that everything was okay. And I wasn't struggling like I am now or I, or I have been previously, but I was still struggling. Yeah. Yeah. I can kind of relate to that because early on in my childhood, I was a bit the same. I, I didn't particularly know how to open up and share my own inner emotions and feelings. And I think being at a private boys school, that's kind of pushed aside and, and the, uh, I guess the stereotype of the masculine man kind of is in the forefront, especially when you've got certain teachers, i.e. sports teachers, when you're playing footy, and you're, you're being told to step on the opposition's throat. And then you're thinking on the other side, well, you know, it's, that's all good and well to do that because you're trying to hype yourself up in the, in the um, I guess, in the heat of the moment when playing footy. But when you look at it on the other side, when you're, when you're being affected and negatively in a you know negative negative mental state you just feel like you're a wuss if you let open up and you feel like someone's going to judge you for it I yeah think, i think personally yeah yep. mate i agree i think um probably the the best thing that i ever did in my life to be honest was i was i was my anxiety was to be honest it was a 10 out of 10 i was barely functioning Mm. I was taking a lot of prescription drugs to get myself out of bed in the morning to get myself to school. Yeah. And after two years of, I don't, to be honest, looking back on it now, I don't know how I got through eight years of teaching in that time. But after about two years, I started looking at these kids and I thought, surely these kids are, surely some of these kids are experiencing something. Maybe not to the extent that I'm going through, but surely mm. some of them are. So I, I just, this was with year 10, 11, 12. So I just thought, you know what? Once a week for 20 minutes, I'm going to, Fuck it, I'm going to talk about myself and I'm going to tell them that mm -hmm. I actually have anxiety and I struggle and I mm -hmm. think about this and this and this. And I didn't think that the kids would really buy into it, but I was mm -hmm. amazed at the amount of kids. Like, no one said anything to me in class. They, you know, the kids at Villa, they always say thank you when they leave the classroom. They're so polite. But the amount of kids that approached me in the playground or knocked on the door in the staff room and wanted to talk to me and said, I want to talk to you. And I was like, what do you want to talk about? And I said, you know, what you said has resonated with me and no one's ever been honest because we saw teachers as these, you know, perfect people. And, and following on from that, when kids finished year 12, I said, boys, add me on Facebook and that's fine. And I'm inundated on a daily basis with kids messaging me from Villanova telling me that they're struggling and they have no one to talk to. They don't want to speak to a psychologist because a psychologist won't talk about themselves, which is their role. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, I don't have personal experience with psychologists but I know you, you do as uh, personally. Um, but I feel like as if they won't give you um, a real life example. And that's where we can step in, I think. Because both yourself and I have faced uh, personal struggles throughout our lives and still at the, at the present time. I feel like because we've got that experience, we can be more relatable to kids and, or anyone that's facing anything. And a prime example, exactly what you're saying. I went into X Cargo one night and I actually met a girl at X Cargo I was speaking to her for a couple of hours and and she was she felt comfortable enough to talk to me and tell me that she would actually been raped at a music festival and that was purely just because i was opening up and saying look i'm going through a bit of a difficult time going through a bit of a breakup just being open and honest and she felt comfortable enough to open open up and tell me that she'd been raped and and she also told me that she actually hasn't even told anyone about this other than myself and yeah that's when i I just, I struggle a bit, to be honest. The fact that something so terrible that it happened to a girl, she feels ashamed for opening up and saying something about it. And it needs to fucking change. It's, yeah. it's getting to a stage now where, like that girl, she, people just feel uncomfortable opening up. They, they feel like they're a wuss for doing it. Um, and I think social media has a massive impact on it as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think... Um Look, I don't think that the thing that I struggle with the most is that suicide rates increase every year yeah. and I think 800,000 to a million people killed themselves last year and yeah. those rates are increasing there. The gradient's positive and it's going up. It's not exponential, but it's increasing. And mm -hmm. one thing that I think will help or would help a hell of a lot, it's not going to solve everyone's problems, but if parents have kids for the right reasons, first of all, yeah. 
And if those parents start speaking to their kids from yeah, a very, very young age yeah. about, how are you feeling today? Like my best mate in Hong Kong, him and his wife are amazing. They have three young kids and they ask them every day, how are you feeling? How, how was school? How did it feel? And they're always talking about feelings. And yeah. back in my day, yeah. uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have spoken about that. And these that. kids are so aware of their emotions from such a young age. It's going to help them because they they know that they can go to mum and dad and talk, they can cry. Yeah. And I, I just think that that is something that parents don't, or adults don't have kids for the right reasons, first of all, but if they do, that's what they need to start doing. And I think that's going to help a hell of a lot in terms of future mental health issues. And maybe it's because um, their parents didn't show them the right way yeah. of going about it because yep. from you know that particular generation, it was deemed unacceptable to talk about your inner emotions and feelings. Um, and I feel there's certain, I guess, for example, are you okay day? I'm not going to mention the, the, the company I work with, but we hold, we hold a barbecue for are you okay day. Yeah. And I feel like as if certain people at the, at the company will just say it, you know, as a bit of a joke, Oh, are you, are you okay, mate? Yeah. And then, Oh, where's the free snag? Yeah. Like it just defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. That, and I feel like people are uncomfortable to actually open up and say anything because everyone's going around saying, oh, are you okay, are you okay, okay. Whereas what needs to be done is it to be done on a more regular basis. If you see someone down or not themselves, like what's so hard about going up and just saying, hey, mate, or, you know, hey, Kate, what's wrong? Like, you know, I can see you're not feeling feeling good. Like there's nothing wrong feeling bad, but I'd hate for you to keep it within, within yourself. It's just, you know, Lash it out of me, I don't care. Yeah. You know, it, it's something that needs to start happening more so. Like, it, it, yeah. The thing that I find or the thing that I've found over the years is that when I have, like, properly reached out to people and told them what I'm actually really feeling and talked about suicide, which is on my mind and has been on my mind mm. daily for 10 years, yeah. a lot of people don't have the skills and aren't equipped to deal with it because they've never been spoken to about it as a kid. And... I've been turned away. Well, not turned away, but I've been being told by many people, listen, Chris, I'm really sorry, but I can't deal with this. And I understand that. I don't get angry with it. I don't get upset with them. But they just don't understand it. Yeah. happens to me a lot. And like I said to you before we started filming, I wouldn't be... The only reason why I'm alive is because of my parents. Because when I started speaking, they were the first people I started speaking to and they were so amazing. And every day I get a message from my mum, how you going? And we have even if it's not a phone call, it's just a text conversation. And, mm. you know, it would have been awesome if that had happened when we were kids, but I wasn't brought up in that era and it's not their fault, but it's happening now. And mm. and they're the two people that I rely on in my life. Yeah. You know? I hope you don't mind me asking, because I, I, I would I would think a lot of people listening in would probably think be thinking the same thing. Why is it that you still feel the same way as you have felt for, you know, for the, how many years is... is I don't know how many how many years have you a decade a decade with, the, with this with debilitating anxiety it's been a decade. So why do you feel like it's it's still the same as it was from the start? You know, like obviously, obviously, um, I don't know. You haven't gone into detail about how you use meditation, how you think that's kind of helping you, yep. I guess, minimize your your um, your stress load. Yeah. But why do you think that you're still struggling? you know, from the start till now. That's actually, you know... Is, it, is there anything that you think is, is ticking through your mind that's going, oh, shit, like, you know, this is why I'm still struggling? That's, seriously, I've never been asked that question and I see a psychologist and a psychiatrist every week and I have done for 10 years and I've never been asked that question, so let me try and answer it. It's a good question. My anxiety started because of a fear of getting back into a relationship and a fear of women. And I still do have that. Like I'm, I struggle to date. I, when I meet girls, it's, it's hard for me and I generally avoid it. Is it because you're still mourning over your breakup with your ex? No, I just, I feel like I'm still, and this sounds weird from a four year old man, but I still feel like I don't have the skills yep. to be in a relationship and yep. to do it properly. No, it's fair enough, man. And it started from that, but with anxiety, it just spreads to everything. So I used to go to school and school was an escape for me because I could decompartmentalize my life at the start. Mm. Relationships are fucked. I can move on from that. School was good, but then it spread to school. So I was 
anxious all day at school and then I could go to my mate's coffee shop who was at New Farm and that was okay and then I was feeling anxious then. It just spread to every part of my entire world. So yeah. to be honest, I, I, I don't know why I'm still struggling with it. It is in the last year, it has gotten better. Mm. We can talk about that and the reasons why it has gotten better. But honestly, I can't, I know my triggers, Yeah. but I don't know why I still feel the anxiety. Do you feel like as if maybe, maybe say for example, you're having a good morning, you're out, you're out with your mates having a coffee or having a feed, and then all of a sudden your, your brain kicks back in and goes, oh shit, I actually haven't thought about all these sort of trigger points that would usually have an effect on me. Oh, quick, let's go back to back to that back to that way again. Do you feel like that that could be the issue that you you're so you're so used to and fixated on the way things usually roll within your brain yep. that when things are going good, you're not used to that. You go back to your you know your the normal state of mind of how you've been living for the past decade. Mate. 100%. You actually should probably be a psychologist rather than a spark. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, no, so no, no. I, I wish. I was saying to you before we started filming that the last three days have probably been the last, the best three days I've had in 10 years. Yep. And anxiety does turn into a habit and it has become a habit over the last 10 years. And the whole time, these last three days, I've been working so, so hard and structured my day and we'll talk about it. Mm. But... The whole time it's been in the back of my head, when's it coming back? 100%. That's all that's in yeah. the back of my head is when is this coming back? Because I can, the reason why I ask is, is because I can see it on your Facebook stories. You might be having a good morning, then a couple of hours later, <laughs> you're, you're writing a paragraph, nothing against it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel yeah. like as if it's it's your mind kicking back into yeah. the normality of, of how you've been living out your life for the past decade. Yeah. You just, you, you want people to, to know that you're struggling, I yeah. think. Yeah. I've, I, so I've been posting on Facebook for about seven years and I, I do it. I don't want, I never want anyone to feel sorry for me. I the re- yourself. The, well, I, it doesn't help me, yep. to be honest. I do it to hopefully, like you're doing this, to help someone else. And if I can help one person, that's the I'd aim. like to help more than one person, obviously, but that's why I do it. To, that's the aim, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, what do I want to say? Um, and... I don't know, is there anything else you'd like to say at all in regards to your, your mental health state or? Yeah, I think that what's really important, so I've attempted suicide twice yep. through trying to overdose and I did a pretty good job both times, but obviously it didn't work. And the second time was seven months ago and I basically woke up, vomited for a week. I didn't leave the house texted mum and dad every day and told them everything was okay. Yeah. Had a thumping headache, didn't get checked out. So I don't know if my organs mm. were ruined or whatever. But at that point, I, I thought to myself, I need to stop relying on my psychologist and psychiatrist to fix me. I need to do this myself. So I've been meditating on and off for 10 years, but not properly. Yeah. So I bought a Muse headband. It's a, it's a meditation device which measures your brain waves and gives you immediate feedback on yep. what brain wave you're in. And for the last seven months, I've meditated. I started at about an hour a day. And then probably for the last three or four months, I meditate for about three or four hours every single day. And I know that's excessive, but it is something that works for me. Yeah, well, if it works for you, why not continue it? Yeah. And I find that, so I, I wake up in the morning, I do an hour and a half. And then in the afternoon, I'll do two hours. And, you know, I'll be, and I'll be 100% honest. If someone, and this is why, so I tutor maths. Mm. So I used to be a maths teacher. I quit a year ago because I just couldn't do it because the anxiety was so much. But I tutor kids now and I tutor 15-year-olds generally and mostly boys. And I always say to them, I wish someone had come to my school when I was your age and they had told me, meditate for five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day for the rest of your life and your life will be better. You will deal with stress better. You will no, I get that. maybe not be happier, but you will actually be able to handle things better. And I like, I honestly think that I would not be in the place that I have been for the last ten years mm. if, like, that's like twenty words. Meditate for ten minutes a day, and your life will be different. But it just never happened. And I and mm. I just that's what I say to all these kids. And it's I'm tutoring maths, but most of the time I'm talking on about mental health. To be honest, yeah. And- what is it that actually got you into um, meditation? Was it a psychologist or you, you just came across 
personally. So her friend Chris Anderson, who went to Villanova, who yeah. he won't mind me saying. So he's a, he runs the the old boys of Villanova now, and he struggles, yeah. he battles, and yeah. he he said to me Christmas Day, he goes, mate, I want you to try this meditation device, and I didn't buy it. He he gave it to me. It's a seven hundred dollar device, and he saved my life. That that man saved my life because he knew how bad I was strong. He said, mate, give this a go and do it, and do it every day, and don't miss a day, no matter if it's doing nothing for you, do it. So I meditated and for two months did nothing. And I was like, this is a waste of time. And then one day I was just like, oh, this is making me feel a little bit better. And then it just, mm. so yeah, Chris Anderson. Do you mind me asking, have you ever gone to like a, a men's talking group at all? Because you've seen like, I know you've seen all these specialists and whatnot, but have you actually been open to speaking in a crowd of guys that are also suffering from the same sort of issue? I haven't. No, I haven't done a men's circle but i have spoken to groups yeah about mental health but no i i, I haven't no i haven't yeah done reason that. reason why i ask is because i've done it myself personally yeah. because only probably six or seven months ago i've been i was quite depressed and quite suicidal myself and i met a lot of different people there were guys in there that had been in prison previously mistreated their wives they were drug and um drug addicts alcoholics but the, the funny thing is that when everyone came together, we, we that we were all there for the same reason. We, I guess, we didn't know our purpose and what live in life, and it's it it's just it's so interesting, like when everyone speaks up and shares their own stories. I mean, I'm 21 and I'm giving advice to like a 40 to 50 year old man, and he's taking upon that advice. They don't give a shit about what age you are. Once you have that, um, I guess, the same common ground as everyone else. Yeah. You know, it's it, you'd be surprised with. Yep. how much of a difference you can make. Yep. Um, I don't know, like, I don't know if you'd ever, you'd ever be up for, for giving something like that a go. I no, mean, mate, 100%. I've just never yeah, cause been I, given that opportunity or so, anyone's ever yeah, brought it up to me. But because yeah. I, know, I know, like, a, a particular company that might benefit you as well. I know you've got your meditation, but it might be something worth trying. Like, it, it was something I did once a week for 15 weeks. Really? Yep. For, um, so after work, I'd go two hours a night. On, on a Monday um, and they go through all different topics so they would also mention stuff about previous relationships so treating a woman right so having that comment that sorting that sort of stuff out as well and then also coming across um, I guess uh, fixing up your anxiety um, in the past I could be quite passive when I used to get stressed I would hit things so trying to alleviate some of that stress load or say for example you've had a shit day at work and and you end up taking it at home. As soon as you walk in the door, they, they up, you know, whoever's whoever's in um, the, from the receiving end, they, yeah, yeah. you take it out of them. Yeah. Just ways of trying to not go about it like that. It's it's really interesting. I don't know, like if you'd be I would be because yeah. I I mean I've taught boys my whole life, but it's me advising them and I mentor boys now and it's basically me telling my story and advising them. So I have never been really advised or been given help by another man who's in the same situation as me who's struggling so no i haven't yeah. ever done that and it was it was interesting because i mean i would i volunteered to be a part of this group whereas 80 90 percent of the guys in that group were ordered by the court okay. to be in there yeah um how did but, they respond after no look the the first cup two or three weeks they're like oh this is bullshit yeah, yeah 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 i don't want to be here yeah. but i have to be here because i'm ordered by the court i'll do i'll do my time and yeah. once that's done I'm, I'm free to roam around and do whatever I need to do. Yeah. After two or three weeks, everyone wants to be there, man. Like, I know one bloke, the first couple of weeks, he he hated it. He didn't talk up. And then one day, he said something. And every single week after that, he was the first person to put his hand up and suggest, make suggestions. Powerful, hey? And after that, after the 14 weeks were up, he asked to do another 14 weeks and he did it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe it'd be something... You might be interested no. in doing something um, anyone else would be interested in doing that is listening. Um, I know there's female talking groups as well. And I'm only I'm only sharing this knowledge because I found this is the best way that has helped me personally throughout my mental struggles. I mean, I've, I, I have seen counsellors and hypno, hypnotherapists. Um, yes, they're good temporarily. And they will, they will share their own personal knowledge within their work, their field of work. But to get, I guess, real life examples of how to 
overcome certain things when you're in a men's group or a girl's group and you're amongst 10 to 15 other people that are in the same sort of boat, whether they're, you know, less, less fortunate than you are or Caucasian, Indian, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. Everyone comes together on the same common ground and they're all feeding off different ideas to try and make themselves better for, you know, for the long run. Mm. It's something you might be yeah, interested yeah, 100%. in. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that sounds cool. But, um, I really appreciate what you've done today, Chris. It, I know, I know it's quite difficult opening up and, and sharing your inner thoughts and emotions, but like, like you said, I'm on the same page, man. This, there needs to be something done with mental health and, like you said, if we can help one person through this video, if I can have one person message me saying, yep. hey, Jaden, look, I'm not in a great headspace right now. You mind if we can catch up for a coffee or just have a chat? Like that, That's all I want. Yep. And if I look at this video and go, hey, look, I've got 500 and 600 views, I'm not looking at it in a way of, oh, like popularity. I'm probably looking at it in a way of, oh, wow, we're really actually making an impact on that many people. Like, yep. Far out. Like, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can actually achieve something through this, you know, like, I think it's just want to butt in. I think what you're doing is pretty good. Well, not pretty good. I think it's pretty amazing. You're 21, mate. Yeah. When I was 21, I was a rat bag and I was Thanks, drinking every it. weekend, playing rugby, thought I was the king. And I think guys of your generation are different. And I think that in time, people like you will make a difference because the generations have changed and you guys are... And you know what, even though at Villa, at the school I taught at, there wasn't being done much by the school, I noticed that the boys were very open. There's, there was gay kids at the school, boys didn't give a fuck. Like, the boys at Villa were really open to different... Don't you agree? No, 100%. Like, the boys were amazing. The, the school wasn't doing much, but the boys were, were amazing. We're very lucky in that that um, brotherhood was there. Yeah, yeah, I they agree. Did, they didn't give a shit, like... If you if you weren't into sport, yep. but you're more academically inclined, you know, go yep. for it. If you if you like guys, who gives a shit? It's, we don't yep. care as yep. long as you're happy, man. Like, and that was know, a massive. Yeah. That was to be honest, that was a huge eye opener to me because I thought I went to Villanova. Do you know I went to Villanova? Oh really? Yeah. Oh, there you it go. It was never my plan to go back and teach there. <laughs> but I went to Villanova and it was very different, mate. We I played rugby and I didn't talk to the the jocks. I did. Sorry, I didn't talk to the academics. Like I was a rugby player. Like. Everyone was segregated, and when I turned up to Villa, I was expecting it to be the same, but yeah. complete culture change. And I think that with the current generation, things will change, but it's, it's going to take time. I think it's just a matter of breaking the walls down. And I find with a lot of things, that a lot of touchy subjects, it only takes a couple of people just to start the ball, get the ball rolling. And eventually, if we can, if we can get one, one other person on board, then more will follow. Yep. And that's the aim, man. Yep. But uh, again, I really appreciate you being here for today. And um, this has been episode two of Couch in the Mind, Clearing the Mind, One Couch Talk at a Time. And the topic today was the mind. And I really appreciate you being here today. And I hope we can make a change in someone's life. Cool.